All right, Rebel EM followers, this is the final and last installment of Trauma Resuscitation Updates. This is part four. So part one, we covered minimizing iatrogenic injury. Part two, we talked about restoring perfusion. Part three, we talked about promoting hemostasis. Those are all posted on YouTube already. For part four, we're gonna talk about controlling bleeding. So, I think the first thing we need to talk about is the importance of getting that hemorrhage control. And I think the first thing from an emergency department standpoint is we want to use the fastest strategy available to us. That could be as simple as tourniquets. That could be as simple as direct pressure, packing, sutures or staples, rushing off to interventional radiology. Ultimately, the goal is definitive surgical repair but there's lots of things that we can do before we even get to that because it takes time to mobilize the operating room to get all the staff in there to have the surgeons review everything and get the patient off to the OR. So as part of our resuscitation strategy, we should be using hemorrhage control and sometimes it's not as sexy as going to the OR, but there are lots of things we can do to try and control that bleeding. The second thing I want to say is that there's so much chaos and so much going on that we want to make sure that we're being systematic in finding our bleeding source. And I like to use this acronym called SCALPER. So S is look for any types of bleeding in the scalp. C is for chest. A is for abdomen. L is for long bones. P is for pelvis. E is for extremities. And R is for retroperitoneum. Now some of these obviously we can see externally. Others will require imaging like ultrasound or even CT scan, but just make sure you're being systematic in looking for that bleeding and not missing things. So I want to start with tourniquets first because I think this is an underappreciated asset, especially in the pre-hospital setting where we just don't have as many resources. And so this was a multi-center prospective analysis of pre-hospital tourniquet use for extremity trauma. And this was basically 1,400 injured extremities. And it was not a randomized trial, it was observational, but they basically wanted to see what was the impact of putting on a tourniquet pre hospitally versus not putting on a tourniquet pre hospitally. And when they looked at those two groups, what they found is that patients who had tourniquets applied early were less likely to arrive to the hospital in shock and there was no difference in limb complications from the tourniquets themselves. So undervalued asset, something we should definitely be using and something we should be talking to our pre-hospital brethren about. The second study I wanna talk about is chest tubes. And this was looking at 14 French percutaneous catheter, what they call the PCAT, versus a large 28 to 32 French, which I think some people might even argue that's not even that big, maybe even 40 French. Open chest tube for traumatic hemothorax, a multi-center randomized clinical trial. So basically looking at 14 French versus 28 to 32 French. And they found no difference in failure rates. And I think this is always the concern when we use smaller chest tubes is that they will clot. Um, now, good luck talking to trauma surgeons or even surgeons in general about using smaller chest tubes, but we know that from the pneumothorax literature, there's less complications, there's less pain for the patient, and so I think we're getting smaller and smaller as time goes on, and I think that's something to, I would say, is on the front of not ready for mainstream yet, but becoming a very uh, important component of care of the trauma patient. Now, my one issue with this study was is that they set this inferiority margin of 15%, which is huge. So you're telling me that if 13 or 14% of patients failed with the 14 French, that it wasn't going to meet inferiority margin and we're okay with that? I don't know. I, I think that's still too big a number. And then the other thing is this was a convenient sample of patients. So they cherry picked the patients that they enrolled in this. And so is that going to be generalizable to all patients to use a smaller 14 French chest tube? Now, certainly I'm always advocating for using smaller chest tubes. Um, I don't think we're quite ready for 14 French, maybe in the appropriate patient, but I think this is going to be a discussion with your trauma surgeon in terms of what standard care is at your institution. 
And then the last study I want to talk about is Reboa. And this was a nationwide analysis of resuscitative endovascular balloon occlusion of the aorta in civilian trauma. Um, this was a retrospective case-controlled analysis of 140 trauma patients undergoing Reboa. And this is what they ended up finding in this study. Reboa patients had a higher mortality than the ones that didn't get it. There was more acute kidney injury, probably from the balloon being up and lack of perfusion to the kidneys. There was more lower limb amputation, and there was a longer time to getting that definitive hemorrhage control, either with IR, interventional radiology, or surgery. Now, recently, the UK Reboa trial was just uh, presented at Critical Care Reviews. Now, the full article hasn't been released yet, but it was 90 patients uh, that underwent Reboa, and they found very similar findings just based on the presentation. I promise once that study is published, I will definitely do my deep dive and get that out to you guys. But I think at this time, Reboa, although it sounds cool and makes a lot of sense, we just haven't found the right niche of patients to use this in. So control bleeding, strategy, be methodical and use the fastest strategy. Tourniquets lead to less shock and no increase in complications. Definitely something we should be implementing. Chest tubes, smaller is probably okay and I think we're trending in that direction. The study that I reviewed, it's unclear. They were cherry-picked patients. They were hemodynamically stable. I think this is a conversation with your local trauma surgeon. And then Reboa, I know there are many facilities that are still using it. I still think we need more evidence to find the right niche of patients to use it in. It's certainly not something that we should just be applying broadly to all trauma patients. Well, there you have it. That is the fourth and final part of trauma resuscitation updates. Please leave me your thoughts, comments, and questions. And as always, Thanks for tuning in.